Okay. Yours. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so um, for those there, um, my name is Elaine Kaneshiro. Um, I was born and raised here in Chicago. And this story of incarceration of Japanese Americans is my family story. Um, my grandfather came, uh, my grandparents actually came from Japan uh, in the early 1900s and well, looking for, well, the reason why people come to, come to the United States is to uh, offer more opportunities, try to build a better life, make a little bit of money to send back home. And so uh, when the war broke out, um, my grandfather had been here for 39 years and considered himself American, despite the fact that he wasn't able to have actual citizenship that was not allowed at that time. Um, and so, yes, uh, my family went to uh, these camps. Um, I think this was an excellent uh, documentary that told a lot about uh, a lot of facts. Um, and yet I learned something new too. So, so even though I know the history, uh, there were things that I learned. Uh, so I really appreciate you introducing me to this video. Um, actually, I kind of want to save my comments maybe in response to the questions that emerge later, but just to let you know that um, I'm representing uh, Christ Church of Chicago, um, affectionately called Tri-C for CCC. Um, my church, um, as well as, I don't know, three or four Buddhist temples and other Christian churches were born out of this experience. Um, 20,000 people moved to Chicago after uh, being encamped. Um, many did not want to go back to the West Coast where um, there was still a lot of uh, racism and prejudice and bad feelings and, and, and it held bad feelings for them. So 20,000 moved to Chicago, which had been identified as one of the cities that might be more welcoming in terms of housing and jobs. Um, so my parents uh, were among those that moved to the south side of Chicago, actually, and then eventually uh, moved up north. And so my church uh, was born on the south side and then eventually moved north. And so many of our members uh, have the same history. Although we are a little bit more diverse now, um, not quite, I, I'm very envious of this church uh, being uh, much more diverse. So congratulations. <laughs> and then I'll be happy to answer any uh, other questions or join in the conversation following about the particular of, of the video. So what did your father do for occupation here? So my father um, actually had uh, a master's degree in uh, chemical engineering from the University of Washington. My parents were living in Seattle, Washington. And I'm not exactly sure, but um, he seemed to have some, he was one of those people that listened to the government and the government said, be American, you know, and, and, and kind of got rid of his Japanese-ness as much as he could. And he, he was set on starting a life in Chicago. So with his degree, he made connections with people from the University of Washington and also with some of the supervisors in the camps, I believe he made friends with. And uh, someone helped him land a job in his field at the Rapid Roller Company on the south side of Chicago, where he uh, worked with the rubber, uh, like the rubbers on the, uh, of the, um, the rollers, on uh, the old typewriters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they, he seemed to work with the chemistry behind that. So, and my mother took a job as a, a house person, you know, helping in households for a while here. Um, and 
they built a life here and stayed all the, the rest of their lives. So Elaine, did yeah. you say, did you grow up on the South side then or the North side? I was born at Jackson Park Hospital. Mm -hmm. um, I believe when I was about, I was a toddler about three years old when my dad uh, moved up to the North side, my parents moved up to the North side. Okay. In Wrigleyville before it was Wrigleyville. Yeah. <laughs> Too bad he didn't keep that house. <laughs> they probably lived in your parents probably lived in the Oakenwald area, right? I mean, when they in those earlier days. You know what? I don't know exactly where they lived. Sorry. Yeah, I, I bet you they did because you know the majority of Japanese Americans seemed to gravitate towards the north side early on. Um, and but there was a smaller group that came to the south side. And they were around the Oakenwald area. There was a larger, but but relatively small group there. And then a few of us were in the Hyde Park area. Uh -huh. um, and I know I've met somebody in Sedona who went to Hyde Park High School, who's like 10 years older than me, but she lived in the Oakenwald area. That's where she went to, to school. And then she would commute up for the dances to the north side you know, and all of the activities up there. So it's kind of interesting, you know, yeah, yeah, the north side, north and south side connection. Well, I've heard stories of how um, when they, when someone found uh, an owner of an apartment building that would rent to the Japanese people, that then all of a sudden a lot of them would follow and they, they would have these buildings. Exactly. That had, had a, uh, quite a few uh, Japanese people of Japanese ancestry and then they formed a little community and offered support to each other. Exactly and that's how my parents ended up in Hyde Park uh -huh. um, because out of camp they well they think they lived at a hostel on the north side which would kind of I mean that allowed them to even leave camp because in order to leave you had to show that you had a place to stay I think, and you also had to have a job or prospects of a job. So um, they were on the north side at the hostel for a short while, and then that got really old and tired and crowded and stuff. So they started, they looked on the south side and they ended up, my dad ended up in a, a small little apartment in Woodlawn. Um, my mom did too, they weren't married then, they came separately. Um, and eventually they knew of a friend of theirs told them that there was a, um, an apartment owner in Hyde Park at 5531 Kenwood who was friendly to Japanese and would rent to them. So mm -hmm. it's that kind of a story. So mm -hmm. that's where we ended up initially and that's where we were born. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you'd like to think that that's the past and would never happen no. again, right? Mm -hmm. But just imagine if, Jap if Jap Japan did something today. I mean, we've got, with all of these conservatives who, what are they? I mean, they want to imprison women who want to get abortions, you know, people who are gay, anybody who's different. Muslims. <laughs> yeah, Mus Muslims, okay. Look how we went bananas about Muslims. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, how, do, how do we educate folks? Um, yeah. I mean, I, because it's a horrendous element in our past. Mm -hmm. And I just wish I could say, okay, that's in the past. Mm -hmm. But I fear that it's not. Well, one of the good things about this film that we saw is that it did trace some of the history of the anti-Oriental uh, attitude in the United States that goes back years. Before years. Pearl Harbor. Right. Exactly. So it's Decades. a long history. Yes of yes. uh, racism against Asian people. Well, it's only because the anti-Chinese that the Japanese came well, in. Well, think of the Merrick McCarran Lawfare Act that limited yeah. immigration from China to 20 people a year. Mm -hmm. I mean, absurd mm -hmm. limiting immigration that much, mm -hmm. but it was out of that bias from the past. Right. And yeah. it shows up on this film. Yeah. It's fortunate that none of us are biased anymore. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a Japanese American friend, Joan Ishibashi, who says one of the reasons she wants to live in Hawaii because there's no dominant ethnic group. 
I mean, whether they don't talk, they talk about it as a mixed salad, they a fruit salad. They don't say a multi pot, but but that's one of the few places in the United mm -hmm. States where you see lots of different folks. Now they have other issues and problems, but I, not the ethnic groups. I but, take pride uh, in that plaque yeah. up there yeah. for mm -hmm. this church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For it's, both of you, for, before we dig in, I want to introduce one of uh, the other of our guest speaker or the key person for this event is Ken Hashimoto. Rather, could you say something to us? Say hi to us for all your to all your old friends. <laughs> all right. Well, let's see. Uh, my life parallels Elaine's, except I think I might be a little bit older than you. So my parents probably came earlier than you. Um, my grandparents came over earlier than you. Um, let me see. Well, they came like over at the turn of the century, 1900, a little before 1900, my grandparents. Um, <clears throat> and they, my mom was from the Palo Alto area around San Francisco, and my dad was from the Covina area in South California, Southern California. Um, my mom, she was more of a city girl. And for those of you who knew my mom, you can tell she was probably a city girl. Mm -hmm. um, she, she liked a lot of activity and fun and stuff. And my dad was more of a serious guy and he came from a farming family. And so they were very different. Um, and they, they knew of each other, even though they lived apart, quite a distance apart through a lot of church activities and other cultural activities. The JACL, the Japanese American Citizen League, and there were a number of larger organizations that held um, retreats like at Big Sur or Big Bear in California and up in Washington, state of Washington and a number of places. So um, that, that young adult community actually grew up learning a lot of leadership skills, thankfully, you know, um, and I think that helped them when they had to be relocated. Uh, and as a matter of fact, when they were relocated um, and they only really had like two weeks between when the notice, the notice went up, posted and they, they were, they left. I was looking at the dates when my parents left and the dates that that notice was tacked on to, you know, in the communities um, was, it was quick. Although they did know, I mean, the state of Washington was, they started there first and that was um, a little bit of time, maybe a month or two ahead of them. So they kind of knew it was imminent, but they, you know, hope springs eternal and you think you have more time. You think you have more time. And then suddenly it was upon them. And then, so I've been looking, I read my mom's brother's diary. He kept it from the pre-war time all the way through camp until he, he volunteered. He was one of those early volunteers from Heart Mountain. And he was killed in the 442nd and that, at that Battle of the Lost Battalion um. Um, over in France. So it, it, it gave me a personal, history, um, insight into what was going on. But there was a lot of activity in the camps um, that Nisei, that was the group our parents were, that Nisei group actually took charge. Well, because they had to actually, because the Issei, their parents who spoke mostly Japanese, um, were kind of subservient in camp. They weren't allowed to do things. They weren't allowed to be block managers. They couldn't take any um, responsibility there. So it's the Nisei, our parents, that stepped up and learned a lot of leadership skills. They started, helped start schools for the children. They wanted to try to make it as normal an experience as they could within with what they had there. So <clears throat> that was interesting. Um, my parents, well, let me see. I don't, I don't know how much you want me to go into camp. Um, but after camp, when um, they moved to Chicago, 
we were basically raised America. And I think part of that is too, you know, about the hammer and the nail is that they didn't want us to experience what they did. So we grew up American, you know, I mean, uh, we were like model kids and we joined the scouts and we joined the swim team and, you know, we did all of those regular activities, joined all the clubs in school um, <clears throat> and just went on our way. And actually, I think, I don't know if it's the same for you, Elaine, but because you were, there were more, there was more of a Japanese community where you lived. Yeah, uh, when there I was very many of us in Hyde Park. No, uh, I grew up in the Japanese community. Okay. Uh, the yeah. Japanese American Citizens League, the, the Japanese American Service Committee, the church, uh, the churches. Yeah, so I did grow up in community. Right. Well, <clears throat> so there weren't that many Japanese in Hyde Park, Japanese Americans. I remember there were a few in my class, um, but even back in those days, it was pretty integrated. You know, one of my best friends was Chinese and there, and there was a Russian. And I mean, it was, it was very integrated and it was, it was a fun community to grow up in. Um, and we really never knew discrimination, you know, or knew about discrimination until we grew up. So, um, and our parents really didn't talk much about camp. I don't know if yours did, Elaine. Um, it's very typical. <laughs> yeah, it's something they wanted to leave behind. Right. Um, and um, they didn't want us to be bitter about it. Right. You know? I, I've had several discussions with different people. And I really think, I mean, um, you were saying about your friend too, right? They, they, I think my parents were in survival, you know, they were in survival mode. They were, you know, my parents, they were just, they were just married and they were just having kids. They needed to find jobs. They, they were, had to build a life. They had to bury that experience in order mm -hmm. to have the strength to do those things. And so, and they did, I, I think uh, they wanted to build a better life for their children. And that's right. what they focused on. I would suggest we can open up for conversation and discussions or share memories. What's the memory of, of Shig? Well, I was thinking of Keo, who one of the church schools wanted to do, one of the curriculum brought up this subject, and we wanted to do it in our church school class. Tried to get Keo to talk, but that was not something she wanted to talk about. She came in and she sort of would respond to questions, but nobody knew what questions to ask mm -hmm. because we hadn't had the responsibilities. But no, it was a very private thing. Mm -hmm. She did not want to talk about it. Well, I think redress kind of changed that a little bit. Yep. Um, once, you know, their experience was validated and also an apology was given by the government, uh -huh. it started to become okay to talk about it. Mm -hmm. and. Let's see, it was probably when I was in college, I, I wasn't living at home, but I was away at college and, and when groups asked my mom and dad to, to talk, they would go, you know, and I think they felt it was their responsibility to do that. Um, so, you know, little by little, it, it became easier for them to talk about. What about your parents and family? Well, our family had an entirely different uh, experience. Uh, my parents were farmers, so uh, I can't remember exactly the detail, but some, some uh, wealthy farmer came down to, we were in Arkansas, for Arkansas, and persuaded several, I think there were like seven families. I remember the barrack type thing. We lived in, in Missouri and we sharecropped hmm. uh, for 
Yeah, I remember this as a child. We we did truck farming of some. I can't remember exactly what we raised, but eventually, out of the about seven families, uh, some of them moved to Chicago. Uh, some of them uh, moved to you know different farm areas, um, and we also moved into a little farm and we did truck farming, vegetable farming. And our we had all of these kids. There were 10 of us. <laughs> but during camp, my oldest sister, who was very ambitious and forward thinking, left camp and ended up working as a maid in someone's house in Cincinnati or Cleveland. And she was like our mentor. From there, each of us left. I mean, living in Missouri, please, Southern mm -hmm. Missouri, this is no place. Um, when we were in school, if we didn't go to school, the school was not integrated. Mm -hmm. Oh, this yes. is, we don't even want to talk about living in a red state. Mm -hmm. But, um, even as soon as we graduated, everybody left. And we all left to large cities, mm -hmm. New York, LA, St. Louis, Chicago, we all left. Mm -hmm. Because I think it was easier for us to get jobs, mm -hmm. even though we were educated. I have out of 10 of us, two of us are nurses, two of us were teachers. We had a, an engineer, the other five, may not have been college graduates, but we had a mechanic, we had a tool and die man, we had, you know, we were all marketable. Mm -hmm. And that's what was very important during that time. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm a niece, which means I'm second generation, even though I'm not that much older than uh, Elaine, I'm a whole generation away. My parents came, are immigrants, they're, they're from Japan. No, my, my older sister and brother did talk, um, they did talk about their camp experience, but they were teenagers, some of them, you know, they had a good time. <laughs> they ran like little gangsters through the camp. <laughs> they would sneak out of camp and things like that. Um, you know, there were other things they talked about, how hard the life was and everything. But as I said, uh, we were in Missouri and as soon as we could, we got out. We had to, it was just, and uh, you know, I moved to Chicago as soon as I was graduated from college and I haven't left. Mm -hmm. So my experience is entirely different from people who came to Chicago, but my brothers did come to Chicago and Hyde Park is where a lot of the Japanese came. Mm -hmm. A lot of the Niseis came to get jobs. Lejeune, can, can you go around, can everybody go around and introduce themselves? So oh. I see who you are, um, please, I, you know, I, I yeah. I think that'd be great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, let's start by me. Although you can see I, me, I, can you try? I can see you, but I hear you. I know. Okay. Yeah, I'm Wayden, and I'm a okay. member of uh, this church. I know I'm you. Like, you <laughs> <laughs> I'm Pam. I'm a member here also. Hi, Pam. I'm Cal. Also a member here. I'm, I'm Jay. Sorry, are you? You said you're Cal. Yeah. Is that Cal Audrain? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Because <laughs> 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 my parents used to do a lot of talk a lot about you guys. <laughs> well, it's nice to put a face with a name now. Huh? And oh, I'm Jane. Jane, what's your last name? Yeah, Kushiji. Yakushiki. Okay. And you ought to tell them because they don't know that she was born in the camp. Yes, I was born in camp. Yeah. In Roar, Roar, Arkansas. Yeah. 
And Jane, are you from Christchurch? Where are you from? No, I'm, I'm she's a friend of mine. I'm I brought her along. <laughs> <laughs> she's so rosy. <laughs> I'm Ann Audrain. Okay. Your mom and dad very yeah, well. Of course. Uh -huh. I'm Debbie Major, and Pam, I have a card in here that you wrote to Ethel Darden with pictures that you had to deliver to Ethel Darden that you had hung on to, and it's, it was, I, I was looking last night for photos of your, of Rio and Keo, and I found them, and then I ran across this card you wrote in 2004 that, <laughs> I'll, yeah, I'll, let me see if I can mm -hmm. hold it up, uh, it's a beautiful card that you wrote. Here's your handwriting. I won't read it, but uh, you had a lot to say. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So, and I'm Ina Grace Dietrich. Um, I came in 79, so I knew your mom, but not your dad. Okay. Okay. I'm Paul Dietrich. I'm sorry? Paul. 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 What was your last name, Paul? Dietrich. Dietrich. Oh, okay. So you're together. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hear it. I hear it. <laughs> <laughs> the dots here. Tracy Napkins. Tracy. My goodness. From Kenwood. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I see a half of a body. Hi, I'm Tim. Um, I live next door and I go to Quaker meeting at the Japanese American Community Center. So I was uh, happy to hear about this event. <laughs> Hi, Sam Guz, friend of Pim. Also happy to be at this event. I heard about it through him. <laughs> <laughs> and the accommodating one here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mina E uh, from South Korea and member of the church. Hi, Nina. Okay, well, it's nice, nice to meet you all. Um, I maybe we should do the screen. Huh? Mm -hmm. Have them introduce themselves. Oh, yeah, people on the screen. So also yeah. introduce yourself. <laughs> Judy Lampkins. Mary we're Lynn Parrish. Charlene Hill. We're all from United Church of High Park. Uh, And you had a question to ask, right? They actually answered it. I wanted to know how were the feelings or the, the any type of just memories shared in the homes? And, and I think you guys answered that. Yours was a little different, but, but similar also. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, you know, when we were kids, I mean, we didn't know about it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if we were like making dinner or we were in the kitchen and stuff and my mom and dad would, would be chatting or say something about camp and I would go, did you go to camp? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, they kind of glossed over it, but it was later on, um, probably in high school that we got kind of curious because we started hearing more about what was, what happened. So we started asking questions, you know, and then when we were in college, that's when it became more acceptable to talk about. And that's when my mom and dad would go talk to different groups and um, we're a little bit okay with talking about it. So it's, I think it's, I find it so interesting that you all had that experience. Was it something it was just within, was there things coming from the communities, coming from the government Why There just wasn't that trying to talk. You said, you know, they were in survivor mode. Was it a fear or it's just, okay, so I can speak to that. The government, the people told them, the, it was the War Relocation Authority, told them not to congregate, told them not to, because they knew there was going to be backlash. And so they said, it, they told them to assimilate. They told them, you know, and, and so my dad, I mean, I know lots of my friends had Japanese middle names when they were born. My parents gave us all American names because he, he, he followed those orders. Not everybody did, but they said, 
you know, please, for your own safety, for your assimilation, just, just be American, you know? <laughs> and um, they did, of course, congregate because they had to, for, they, they needed a community, right? So the churches, for a lot of them, the churches became their community. So the Tri-C, my church, you know, there were, I don't know, in its heyday, hundreds of, of members, they did voice, they did scouting, they did sports, they did fellowship, they had dances, they had bowling teams, they created, they did congregate because out of survival, but they also, you know, that was their time, but then they had to go out in the world and, and, and um, I learned about camp the same way that Pam did when my parents had friends over, the first thing, that, or when they met new people, the first question was, what camp were you in? And, we're, and, and so I, I heard it, but I didn't really understand any of it until, until much later. And I think redress, like you said, in the 1980s, um, it, actually it's, it's my, my generation. So I, you keep hearing these Issei, Nisei, Sansei. If you count in Japanese, it's Ichi, Ni, San, Shi, Go. The Issei were the first immigrants from Japan. The Nisei were my parents' generation. So I'm Sansei. My son is Yonsei. So, so it's, it's my generation as they became educated because education was so important the attorneys and the historians and all these people said this was wrong <laughs> and yeah. so they were the they, they were the movement and uh that spurred they were the people that spurred the uh the reparations movement and so in 19 was it 89 the civil liberties act was passed like they said in there you know but the big piece was so there was an apology from the president there was signed by George Bush. There was uh, twenty thousand dollars given to each person, the surviving person that was incarcerated, and the big piece was that was there was uh, an education fund, mm -hmm. and that education fund has spurred a lot of books and movies and technology uh, monuments. Almost all the camps now. <clears throat> have monuments. Several of the camps have built museums that house artifacts, that tell stories. There are websites that uh, have oral histories because they've co collected hundreds of oral histories throughout the years. And the important thing is this history needs to be known. Yeah. The, the fact that the government acknowledged that this was wrong and get compensated and set up an education fund this is important for the for now because you know what happened at at right after at 9 11 right the 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 trouble that all the muslim community went through the patriot act that was passed mm -hmm. that you know about you know gave more authority for surveillance of of citizens um, interestingly enough, you may have heard, I've, I have, I actually have a photo of, is there a way to show my, um, I've got a photo of someone who's was in the news this past week. Uh, keep going. I'll keep scrolling down to, oh, the neck, the, up. Oh, sorry, back, not, not that one. One before that? There, have you seen this guy's picture he was in died. was mm -hmm. in has been in the news, right? Yes. This is Norman Mineta. Uh, he lived. He was incarcerated. He's a Nisei, so he's second generation. He lived in Heart Mountain, uh, which is in what was in Wyoming. He when when he was oh yeah okay. He wore his Boy Scout uniform when they were taken away to camp. Mm -hmm. And they eventually, you know, they started activities in the camps. And so they started Boy Scout troops in the camps. His Boy Scout leader 
reached out, this was in Cody, Wyoming, reached out to other Boy Scout troops in the area and nobody really wanted to come into this prison camp to, to do activities with them. They were gonna have this Boy Scout Jamboree and invited other troops. One troop came from Cody and they were the boys were matched up and partnered to do their activities, the knots and the fire building and all of that. He was paired up with a boy whose name was Alan Simpson. Really? The Alan, Alan Simpson. The Alan Simpson. <laughs> they became friends in, in, in camp, the in the internment camp. When the war was over, they went their separate ways. Uh, uh, Norman Minetta became the mayor of San Jose. He then served in the House of Representatives as a Democrat, where guess who he ran into? Yeah. Alan Simpson, who was a Republican in, at, in the Senate. But they had built a friendship. Alan had Not known. Like the conservatives today. Yeah. Simpson was better than that. Yeah. <laughs> and during the reparations time, the redress, the fight, uh, you know, to prove that this was wrong, right? It violated civil rights. Alan Simpson, who was respected, helped with this movement. Mm -hmm. Amazing story, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And if you uh, go to the next screen. Okay, so there they are, Alan Simpson and Norman Minetta at boys, as, boy, as young boys. And then the next screen shows... Uh, the, they met in in Washington D.C. again and became lifelong friends. They, um, uh, they their families actually traveled together. So they worked across the aisle for the good of of the country, and they passed the Civil Liberties Act. Uh, it wouldn't have been done without these two men. It wouldn't have happened, but there were several. There were several other Japanese uh, Americans in Congress at that time, which shows that representation matters, mm -hmm. right? Um, and um, I just think it's a wonderful story. And um, yeah, there have been a lot of. There's been a lot of stories this week about Norm Norman Minetta. Mm -hmm. So he's one of those people that's going to be um, as we go forward and um, share education, especially with in, in Illinois, and I don't, I don't know if you know, this past year, the TEACH Act was passed, which is about teaching Asian American history in the schools. Uh, I think it's in, I think it has to start in 2023, but it's now going to, there's going to be mandated curriculum now, mm -hmm. uh, all, all Asian American history, not just this history. Yeah. I just, I, when you say words like to say it was wrong, you know, an apology or and reparations and, you know, mandated teaching, I just can't help but feeling how, how is it so strong for one group and not another? I just, I, it just makes me sad, but also proud of me. You know, I think about what's happening in Florida, but I think about just as a Black woman, how, I mean, to say I'm sorry to have your government say that and, you know, not just have an act and for things to just continue to be the same. I just, I, I am in, like, I wish I knew, like, what could this forgiveness that, and, or to stand up and to say, we won't let this happen again, even though after our previous administration, there was a hatred that was targeted to oh, yeah. but, but it's every day. And I, I just see how some groups like, Irish when, and I've heard stories, not being from Chicago, but how when they came to Chicago, how they were treated. And just the names that's associated for a derogatory name with Blacks was upon that. And just how, I don't, I don't think it's even assimilation, but things just change in its acceptance. But I just don't see that as, again, I'm, I'm, I'm sensitive about that. I you totally, I, I think, I, my heart, <laughs> Hurts, yeah. I, I, yeah, I told her. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you talk about books and education, like no more talks about gays in some schools, but no more talking about you know. In Texas, tried to they actually published a book that blacks came here in search of a better life and working conditions. 
No, <laughs> you know, it's just what, so that's great to hear that, you know, this is going to be mandated education as it should be, as it should be. But it's just so like, I just don't understand how just that hatred could linger and change forms and identity. Yeah. And yeah. At it, human beings always seem to need to find somebody who's less than they are. Yeah, maybe it's the original sin. I don't know. But and and you're right, it, it changes shape and attacks different groups. But blacks are remain. I mean, right. always, always, always. Always. I mean, I think I think I think the tide is turning, but it may take 20, 30 years mm -hmm. before. I mean, be, they, they are fighting a losing battle, but they're fighting hard, Texas and Florida. And they're going to hurt a lot of people in the process. And uh, let's just be glad we live here. And <laughs> the only thing yeah. I could say to you is um, there are slivers of hope every once in a while. Mm -hmm. So the alderman, alder person, the alder woman from Evanston. Oh, oh yeah. The, mm -hmm. yeah. Ruth. Oh, darn it. I forgot her name. <laughs> but I know. Who yes. Anyway, right? Reparations mm -hmm. in Evanston. The Japanese, one of the leaders in this movement towards reparations for Japanese Americans, John Tateishi, who was instrumental in, in that work for several decades. I, I participated in a, uh, a webinar or a Zoom or whatever it was with the Japanese American leader and this older woman from Evanston. They had an amazing conversation about reparations for Black people, Black Americans. And he told her exactly how it happened. And that for Japanese Americans, the, the Congress started a commission to explore this. The commission was like 12, a bipartisan commission that traveled to most mostly major cities across the country and they did took in they did let speakers they interviewed and asked questions of all these different people and did their research they were tasked with this i was like a two-year or three-year i don't know a commission that traveled and researched and they came back and they are the ones that said this is a violation of civil rights he said and so he said you got to do that. It went to, you know, so there, I don't know where it is right now, but they're in Congress in, within the last year, right? There's a bill about forming a commission to do the, to do this work. And so um, I believe that all marginalized groups, people of color need to come together in solidarity because you, it's too big. We have, we have to. Right, work together and, and support and Harvard University, admitting that their success yeah. has been built upon slavery. Right. Now yeah. we can all say that's too little, too late, but it's something. And yeah. so, if we can get more, but that's also the reason. I hope you all listen, all you United Church of Hyde Parkers. We are a unique congregation mm -hmm. with a lot of different kinds of folks interacting, praying, worshiping, and working together. And we're not that usual across the country. Isn't it? I don't know the statistics, but Sunday morning is still a very segregated Absolutely. time. Absolutely. By, by race, yes. ethnic, yes. you know, a lot of different reasons. Mm -hmm. But we need to celebrate our congregation and affirm our witness. And if, is that in our case study? We're working on a redevelopment project mm -hmm. and going to be major fundraising. And that needs mm -hmm. to be in there. But I, but I do say, I think the Harvard University, so, and, and but it's hard. You got to take, you got to rejoice when those moments happen, but then work hard to but get more of them. I, I don't want to take this conversation away. I think it's just so important for you to share and talk about because your, your family didn't, and like you said, the redress helped to bring that on. So it's just, it's good that, you know, generations to come won't forget about the story mm -hmm. and that they can talk about it and mm -hmm. just, I think it's. I don't know. And so um, our church started a justice and equity um, group 
in the, within the last three years to learn more about the black experience and um and it's been horrifying <laughs> you know listening to podcasts reading books and everything and um but that's where we started because we said we need we need to know more we trying to figure out our role i mean we are people that experience this racism and prejudice we have a responsibility right to stand in solidarity with others so and and it's the racism against black is so deeply rooted from the very beginning of the country mm -hmm. and so that makes it i think that makes it harder right and and it permeates everything every facet of our lives of our society and so it's it's much harder i I wish I had answers. <laughs> but I feel like talking about it in this kind of, I mean, I felt so ignorant throughout this conversation, like even you sharing that, okay, so reparations actually were paid. I had no idea. I learned nothing in 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 government school, if you will, right, about right. that. There, so it wasn't there, it wasn't it was, taught. Right, it was up to, I guess it was up to me and it made me, and now I'm feeling like, oh, I, I really don't know a lot about it. And then I'm feeling like, well, like Pam, like, okay, so, if it was wrong for them, how was it not wrong? How right. how does how does anyone in their logical mind, regardless of your your right, your left, or whatever your political blah blah blah, if it was wrong for this group, how is it not wrong for this other group? Right. How could you how can you justify that? And then, well, if they got reparations, well, wait a minute, you figured it out for them, why why can't you figure it out? And can it be used as some sort of precedent? But it seems like the more people know, like. If you're able to see that it was wrong for this group, then I feel like that would help others then that are ignorant, like myself coming into the situation, like, oh, well, if they got it, how can we not get it? That I feel like that will help with the conversation. Mm -hmm. So I mean, like you're talking about through the education, that's I feel like where it all lies is that we just don't know these things to be able to then say, hey, that we know it wasn't right, but if you can acknowledge that it wasn't right, how can we then move forward? How do you then use that for this group, for the next group then. Mm -hmm. And then like you're saying, stand together. Mm -hmm. How do you get people to stand together and not feel like I wanna stand with you, but now am I a target? How, how do I, how do we take well, those next steps? I think steps? a couple that, you know, stood and, and testified and, you know, took the possession so they could save it. I, I just think it takes that kind of individual strength. And, mm -hmm. but, but it's kind of strange because I think the, the per pervasiveness of racism and how deep it is in American roots almost makes it more difficult to fight. I mean, Japanese Americans, you were a designated group, so they could identify you. Um, I don't and think what we've done to Native Americans, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but that's another designated. But African American Black folks, it's so pervasive and so deep. Yeah. It's it's as even more horrendous but how do how do we fight it and how do we even get it recognized i also think i don't know if you guys can hear me i've been kind of typing the same things but y'all not reading my chat so i'm gonna talk um i think for america to apologize to blacks would be to say that america is wrong yeah. and america yeah. is not willing to say that because it happened at the beginning of their history for them to say something to African Americans or people of African descent would mean that they could they would have to humble themselves. They would not be able to be proud of America as it is. And they're not willing to do that. They're not willing to do that. I think the, the crime against blacks is so insidious um, that they're not willing to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my, my two cent worth on that. Um, I think what happened, I mean, the movie was very educational, but I too kind of felt like Pam, not, not a little bit more bitter, like, you know, when we were enslaved, it just, it was just a different thing. Like you guys were still allowed some human decency. I mean, it's still very sad what happened. You were allowed to resume, but we've got hundreds and hundreds of years and the impact of slavery is still lived out today. But my question was, I don't know, you know, I, I noticed like Mexicans have pride. There's certain ethnic groups that have pride. And I wanted to know what pride looked like for Japanese Americans. Is there that some kind of pride you all have? And pride in Japan, they don't go together. I mean, I mean, is when I, the Japanese mm -hmm. folks, I Hold know, on, my question is- Very humble. <laughs> I mean, they almost, they almost fight against being prideful, right? 
You're not supposed to stick out. No, I'm, 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 oh, really? I mean, that's really true. Yeah. One, I haven't finished my question. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. I listened to all of your questions. So I'm just asking, how do you identify? And maybe you don't. I'm just trying to unpack that as I'm learning here today also. And then I wonder, as you have some kind of identity, how does it cause you to see uh, the pain of other indigenous or marginalized groups. Um, also, and I wanna put on the floor that I noticed there is tension between certain Asian groups, but there's also tension between Asian and African-Americans. Um, that's very real. And so just wondering, I would think with all of the pain we've been through that we, this would be a point of connection. So just wanted to hear your thoughts and reflections. <laughs> Okay, there are a couple of questions. <laughs> um, I think I think among the Japanese community, it isn't as segregated. Um, I think over the years, there's been so much intermarriage. Or you know, this is just my my point of view, and I haven't grown up in a Japanese community, but it seems like there's been so much. Uh, intermarriage and I mean it's there isn't I guess if you lived in a in, a, in Los Angeles or San Francisco or wherever where there's a large Japanese community that's that's organized um, it would be different but I don't I think of myself as Japanese American but I almost think more of myself as an American of Japanese descent and that's a little bit different um, I like to place myself as American first, um, but of Japanese descent. Um, but that's that's kind of how I feel about it. And so, what does that mean? No, no. Pardon me. <laughs> if, you, if that form was here now, which would you select when you? No. <laughs> the loyalty questionnaire. Would you be oh. a no, no? <laughs> I don't know, it's really hard. I mean, would I be a no-no? I'm not forswearing allegiance to anybody. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I would I would serve in the armed services if needed. So I guess I'd be a yes, yes. I don't know. Um, but when that when that questionnaire came out, it was such a divisive thing. Um, it, it tore families apart. I mean, their parents, if they forswore allegiance to the emperor, they were in no man's land because they were not allowed to be an American citizen and then they couldn't be Japanese either. So, <clears throat> and they couldn't serve in the armed services anyway. So um, that was a, on hindsight that, that questionnaire was was not expected to be the, the bomb that it was. It was really designed to determine who could be considered loyal enough to be able to leave camp. Um, <clears throat> and they just didn't realize how divisive it, it would be. Um, and how many, well, actually that's my, that's why my, my dad left, tried to leave camp early. Um, he was there really in Heart Mountain, maybe only a year. And the first people to leave, I believe, were the students who would be in college. And there were certain colleges in the, in the United States that were open to Japanese Americans. They, they welcomed them. Um, Oberlin College is one of them. There, there are a number of them. Mm -hmm. um, and so they were among the first to leave. My dad left in early because he... He probably pulled some strings, but he said, he told us later, you know, when we were growing up that he had to get out of there. It was crazy, you know, you get that many people locked up um, and with nothing to do, that it just becomes a time bomb. And he said, people were, were at each other all the time. Um, and you don't see that in the propaganda films you know, where it shows people perfectly dressed and them all getting along. 
but it wasn't always like that. Um, so he, he managed to leave camp early. My mom followed four months later. So they weren't among the casualties. The casualties were really the Issei, the first generation who didn't speak English or very little. And um, well, the elders who, who lost everything, you know, if they had any connections before they left, it was never there when they came back. They had no place to go. Um, but the Nisei and the, and the high school and college educated were able to leave early. And so thankfully they did. My, my, um, so my parents didn't have the traumatic experience that many, many of them did um, who, who had lost everything. My, my mom's family lost their stores because they had grocery stores and a boarding house but they had to close up in two weeks. So they sold everything at pennies to the dollar um, and just carried whatever they could, you know. And thankfully, there, there are wonderful people in the communities everywhere who, who are kind of the unsung heroes that step up when needed and would, would hold things for the families so they would have something coming back. On my dad's side, he had a, the grandfather had a friend who paid the, the mortgage while he was gone so at least he could have a place to come back to mm -hmm. so um they're wonderful people everywhere and they're often connected with the churches that's what i saw is the people who were who were there to support the people who needed it when they needed it so anyway you guys are doing a great job I'm trying to, I'd like to say i'd like to say a couple of things uh one is I grew up during the war. Um, I was in high school and graduated in 1946, the year the war officially ended. Um, so that means that I was in high school during the almost the total incarceration of the Japanese Americans. But I was also brought up in the, in the United Methodist Church. My father was a Methodist minister. I grew up in that parsonage. We had Japanese American guests stay in our house many times during the war. Uh, I grew up in a church where we heard about all of this. Mm -hmm. And it was the Methodist church at that time was very pro uh, sympathy. I mean, the sympathy was really great. Uh, f f from inside the church, where, at least where I was, in western New York, uh, very favorable and, and sympathetic to the Japanese American cause. Now, um, that's, that's the first thing I want to say. I think we cannot underplay the role of the church in this culture on behalf of, of groups that have been outcast, persecuted, etc. The second thing I'd like to say is that the Japanese experience, and it's just tough for me as a white person to say anything about any other race or, or color or national, national group, but I'll be bold for a minute here. Um, I see the story of the Japanese Americans and African Americans as two very different stories. The Japanese Americans had something taken away from them. The African Americans had to start fighting from the very beginning to get a hold of anything. Of anything. And it's a it's a it's a different story. Now we live in a time when the rights of women are being yanked away from them. And it's going to cause an uproar eventually. Sooner or later, the women in this country are going to say, we don't like this. But, uh, but uh, when somebody has something taken away, that's more visible, it's felt more acutely, it's more dramatic than if you never have anything in the first place and you're scrambling for any morsel you can get. I just think, I think they, they pull on different... No emotions. less wrong. And, and damaging, mm -hmm. but yes, it's, it's more difficult to get your hands around, but we got to keep trying. 
I've got to run, but I want to say thank you to Wei Zhen for just bringing us together. <laughs> and I'm so grateful to meet all of you and hear your story. And Pam, you said you would come and you did. <laughs> well, you said you think about it. So <laughs> thank you, you for too. coming. Oh, thank you so much for this. It's 10 after 12. Oh, so wow. we can have five more minutes. So oh. anyone uh, did not speak yet, please you can share your thoughts. Before we close up, <laughs> do you have anything you want to share with us? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> I will keep thinking. Probably, I will not come up with something within five minutes. <laughs> but, um, okay. One thing I want to, in so many ways, we celebrate diversity, which is good. But on the other hand, if people are too different, we don't like it. <laughs> so we're, we're caught and our society chooses to focus on the diff differences. Yeah. I just can't help thinking about our new press secretary. Every time they talk about her, they identify what she is, yeah. where we can't just accept her for who she is. It, it's, we seem to have problems right now. But we need to learn new attitudes. We do. And new behavior. And that's why the liturgy and practice of the church is so important in trying to help us learn new ways to deal with each other, even when we don't agree. Yeah. We and, and to agree. Right, right. But but how do we get along? And and how can how can our faith enable us? to do that and to see people in different ways. Yes. And it's, well, it's hard when you come up against something that's different. I mean, I, my, my granddaughter is gay and married. And I, it was really a shock to me when I realized that that was kind of hard for me. And I thought, good grief, I'm so liberal, right? But when you've never experienced, I'm seven, six, but when you've lived all your life around people and expected certain things and then different things happen, you have to stop and say, well, now, wait a minute. I don't know how to deal with this. Mm -hmm. But that's when we need to turn to one another and, talk about and maybe get yeah. some new skills you know, and they want to have a baby too. And it's just, I mean, I found myself thinking, gee, I want, I want a man to be able to take care of Courtney. And then I thought, really? A man to take, you know? <laughs> but we all have these ingrained attitudes and expectations and understandings that lie beneath the surface. And so how do we get them up, look at them and change them? Well, I think a lot of it is how we're raised, mm -hmm. you know, and the, and the values that our parents instill in us um, helps us view the world. And it maybe will take generations, but we've got to start. So um, it all starts with us. I kind of feel as if... Um... <laughs> I haven't addressed Charlene's question. Um, well, we can go to lunch, Elaine. I know, yeah. but, but I do want to say something because I think it's, it, there are lots of answers um, I, and in, in lots of facets. And one is that the Japanese culture is don't stand out, right? Yeah. Really? <laughs> the nail that sticks up gets hammered down. So that's part of who we are. I, it's part of who I am, I, I, am, I know. Um, there are, though, there are activists um, in the Japanese community uh, that are doing things. Um, there's a national group called Suru for Solidarity that has, that has been, you know, has gone down to the borders that have been protesting in the, the mass incarceration. There's a group here, um, Nikkei Uprising, that, it, and there, it's the next generation, though, yeah. who don't have as much of that you know, mm -hmm. reserved <laughs> uh, th those cultural uh, influences that are that I went with them down to Cook County Jail, you know, um, during protesting the incarceration. And many, many of them are, are minorities, right, that are in there for so many crazy 
unjustified reasons and they weren't given uh, PPE during the beginning of the COVID and people were dying. And so there are groups, there are pockets of people and groups that are do, that are standing up. We had uh, we we had an intergenerational um, meeting with the African Americans at the JASC, and and what her, what was horrible for me to hear is that people that are half Japanese and half black uh, said they were more accepted in the black community than in the Japanese American community. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I just, that was heartbreaking to me. You know, we have, we have a lot of work to do in our community. There's no question about it, but there are conversations going and I see some things happening. I, we absolutely owe the black community uh, support and, and voice some solidarity. We do. I believe that anyway. Uh, I'm sorry that we haven't done more. <laughs> um, I, I hope that there are more collaborations and 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 these small conversations help, you know. They do. So thank you for, for providing us this. Taking grace in the church. Yeah. Yeah. That's what the church ought to be doing. Yeah, before we close up, any final thoughts? Yeah. No, I think uh, today is a very good beginning for our further yeah, yeah. project, different project together, different project we can hold on together. I hope that there will be a very good beginning for us. And I want to say thank you for Elaine and Pen again uh, to tune to share your story mm -hmm. and Jen too. And, and hopefully we can meet again soon, mm -hmm. have more project together and make a difference in our community. And we have some goodies here, so if you have a goodie, you can have anything you want. <laughs> we, we've been having a conversation in our church about confession, prayers of confession, and forgiveness. Well, I think we've recognized here that there may be some things we do need to confess as a congregation. And um, words of assurance to give us some impetus to change some things. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and thank you for joining us, you. us today. And have a blessing evening and afternoon. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.